Thank you to everyone who has who has logged on to join us tonight. If you're in the UK this morning, if you're in California with me, or whatever time it is when you when you actually end up watching this, um, I am going to be talking about my new book, which is called Life as We Made It. I work in a field that is called ancient DNA, um, and um, ancient DNA is a, a field. It's it's an area of research in which people like me uh, develop methods to recover and analyze. DNA that just happens to be preserved in the remains of plants and animals that used to be alive. Um, it's not a particularly old field as far as scientific fields go. The first successful recovery of ancient DNA was in 1984, so not very long ago, when scientists working in Alan Wilson's lab at the University of California, Berkeley, managed to get short fragments of DNA from the preserved skin of a quagga. That's this guy you see on your screen. Um, the results weren't particularly remarkable. It turns out the quagga is, as looking at this photo might lead you to guess, an extinct type of zebra. <laughs> but the idea that DNA stuck around and didn't degrade right away after death was remarkable. And in the nearly 30 years since then, we've learned that DNA is actually preserved in lots of things, in bone, in teeth, in hair, even in hair without a root, which is something that people believe they spend a lot of time watching these crime solver movies and TV shows that you need a root. You don't, there's tons of DNA in that hair shaft that's just degraded, like DNA from something that's been in dead for a while. In mummified bodies like this little um, extinct cave lion cub that's up there at the top of your screen. Um, in eggshells and other types of shells and bird seeds and plants in, in preserved poop there you see at the bottom um, and also uh, moccasins. Um, and I've been working on a, a project on moccasins that are preserved in promontory caves in Utah that, that these are our selection of those. And we can extract DNA from these moccasins and learn not only what animal hide was used to make them, but also about the people who wore them from shed skin cells that are preserved inside the moccasin where people's feet were. Um, as of today, the oldest ancient DNA that's been recovered is from this mammoth tooth that's at the bottom other corner of your screen. Um, this is the Krestovka mammoth, and it's somewhere around 1.2 million years old. This is the oldest DNA that's been recovered and authenticated by far. It's from a, a slightly different type of mammoth that were the last mammoths to have been alive, but very closely related to the mammoths that we know and, and love, of course. And DNA of this age is very rare. Mostly when things are about you know, 20, 30,000 years old, um, if they're not preserved in a very cold place or a place where it has an extremely stable environment outside of the sun, the DNA is degraded away to such an extent that we can't do anything with it anymore. So over the years of working with ancient DNA, um, we've learned a lot about more recently extinct species. Um, lots of discovery made possible using these technologies. My own early work, for example, when I was a PhD student at Oxford, was my first ancient DNA project. Um, I got DNA out of the preserved dodo specimen that's on display at the Oxford University Museum of Natural History. It also counts as the most nervous I have ever been when working with an ancient specimen as I held up a Dremel tool to the leg bone of this famous dodo and was just like, oh my God, am I really going to cut a piece out of it? But I did eventually, tiny piece, and we extracted DNA from it and we were able to show that the closest living relative of the dodo is a Nicobar pigeon. In fact, it is just a type of big fat pigeon, which is both disappointing and exciting all at the same time. <laughs> Um, more recently, as we've been working in the Arctic in North America, we've discovered that there were several different species of equid that lived at the same time and went extinct only around 12,000 years ago. This is a picture of a new type of horse called a stilt-legged horse, and we got to name it. We named it Harrington Hippus after Dick Harrington, who's a paleontologist who had first described their remains. And these horses lived at the same time as regular horses that we know and love today lived in North America, went extinct about 12,000 years ago. And of course, the most famous discovery probably to date with ancient DNA was made when the team of researchers in Leipzig in Germany, the Max Planck Institute, got DNA from that little tiny pinky bone that you see there on the hand and were able to show that it belonged to a lineage of humans, they were human-like um, 
people that uh, we didn't even know existed. And these people have been called the Denisovans um, after the Denisova cave where this particular remain was found. And now we know from studying the genomes of Denisovans and Neanderthals that when people, anatomically modern people, Homo sapiens, left North um, left Africa and moved into Europe that they interbred as they were distributing, moving across Europe and Asia with Neanderthals and Denisovans, such that most of us today have at least some small amount of Neanderthal and Denisova DNA in our own genomes. But if we go all the way back to the beginning of the field of ancient DNA, back to 1984, we also see that there is one question that all of us in the field are often asked. And here is Alan Wilson, the first person to lead a group extracting ancient DNA, being the first person to answer that question. Is it possible, based on what you have discovered here, to bring extinct species back to life? And answering it, no, the possibility of actually bringing extinct species back to life is extremely remote. 30 years later, this idea has a name, de-extinction, and let's face it, you all logged on today to ask me this question, didn't you? Well, fine. <clears throat> Here's your update. And I happen to be in a great place to update you as I have just joined the scientific advisory board of a new company that I'll tell you a bit more about in a minute that's been formed with the explicit goal to resurrect a mammoth. As of today, de-extinction is still not possible. It is not possible to resurrect dinosaurs. Remember, the oldest ancient DNA that's been recovered is 1.2 million years old. And dinosaurs have been gone for more than 65 million years. So there is no dinosaur DNA, dinosaur bones, fossils are all rocks and rocks don't have DNA. We also can't resurrect mammoths and we can't resurrect passenger pigeons or stellar sea cows, which were these amazing creatures that used to live in the very cold Arctic until just a few hundred years ago, or the dodo or Tasmanian tigers or the gastric brooding frog. I always like to highlight this one because this species has only been extinct for a couple of decades. And this is an amazing species or cluster of species where the, the frogs would swallow the tadpoles and put them in a different part of their stomach where they would form into fully formed frogs. And then they would barf up these fully formed frogs um, rather than have the tadpoles swim around and at risk of being, um, being eaten by other things. If I was gonna bring something back, it would be something awesome like this, right? Um, we also can't bring back Lonesome George. Um, this picture was taken while he was in captivity. Um, he's a Pinta Island giant tortoise. He died in 2012, after which he was, he was probably between 80 and 100 years old, but he had spent most of his life as the very last member of his species. Um, he lived, as I said, for about 40 years in captivity, during which time he had lots of opportunities to breed with closely related species, but none of it was successful. All of these are extinct, and it is really important to understand that once a species is gone, it is actually gone. De-extinction is not a viable way to imagine that we're going to preserve biodiversity. So why is it that DNA de-extinction is still not possible? Why, why can't we do this yet? The issue is that there are technical challenges and also ethical and ecological challenges, but let's stick with technical for now, um, that we still really haven't been able to overcome. Let's focus on the mammoth. So we can get DNA from well-preserved mammoth bones. This is my friend Lova Dahlen, who is um, a professor at the Natural History Museum in Sweden, and he's holding an extremely well-preserved mammoth bone from Wrangell Island. And these are some of the most recently alive mammoths. They didn't go extinct on Wrangell Island until around 3,000 years ago, but they, they are extinct, and that means that there's, there's no living cell in these bones that are there. But we can get whole genomes, short fragments, degraded DNA, but all of it, and we can line them up on a computer after we've extracted these short fragments with uh, against the genome sequence of an Asian elephant. This is the closest relative, closest living relative of mammoths. They diverged from each other around five or six million years ago. And we now know we've been able to count the number of differences on the computer between genetic differences in the DNA code between an Asian elephant and a mammoth. And there's around one and a half million differences. So the idea then is that maybe what we could do is use genetic engineering, gene editing technologies, and 
have some Asian elephant cells that are growing in a dish in a lab and a little bit at a time use gene editing to cut out the Asian elephant version of that DNA and paste in its place the mammoth version of the DNA. Make somewhere around a million and a half changes to the DNA in those cells growing in that dish. So eventually you have cells growing in a dish that are alive that contain the genome sequence of a particular mammoth, right? And then you have these living cells. We could clone them, right? We could do the same process that brought us Dolly the sheep and take those living cells and put them in an egg cell from an Asian elephant and then have that thing start to grow up and develop and become an, an embryo and then implant that embryo into an Asian elephant surrogate mom where it would start to develop and, and become, that is, by the way, a, a, a picture of a developing elephant. Isn't that one of the most adorable things you've ever seen? The answer is clearly yes. I can't hear anything that you're saying, but I'm imagining that you're saying, yes, that is the most adorable picture I've ever seen because that is what I want to believe. And then after this thing grows up perfectly well, it's born and then elephants somehow teach it how to be a mammoth. Well, that's I mean, a lot of this is a little bit, little bit peculiar. Well, actually all of this really from steps three to five are, are gonna be a little bit challenging really to, to make happen. We really can't make a million and a half changes at once. And we, we can't use Asian elephants as surrogate hosts. We, we don't know how to do that sort of surrogacy in elephants. It hasn't been achieved before. And then like teaching a, 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 a something that was born and started to develop inside an elephant, how to be a mammoth when there isn't a mammoth left to teach it how to do that is, is really going to be difficult. So even if we were able to do parts of step three, what we would end up with really is something a little bit mammoth like an elephant that's a little bit mammoth like maybe you know a, a cold adapted elephant to which we've transferred some of the genes and traits that evolved in mammoths to tropically adapted elephants so that they are able to live in the types of habitats that mammoths used to live and this in fact is what this company that i've brought up before it's called colossal um, is really trying to do led by tech entrepreneur Ben Lam and George Church, a Harvard scientist who's already started editing Asian elephant cells in a dish in his lab. He's managed so far with his team to make about 50 different changes to that genome, focusing on genes that might give that elephant, if it were able to be born, some of the adaptations that would make it make it able, better able to survive in the, in the cold environment in which mammoths once, once lived. Um, the idea is that they will create these animals they're able to release into the Siberian tundra. Um, there's even a place called Pleistocene Park that Russian scientist Sergei Zimov and his son Nikita have been preparing for mammoths and other Arctic adapted species to come. So, yeah, I can't see any of your faces because we're not in person and well, I won't go into all the reasons that that sucks. Um, although near the top of that list is that I am not in London and I won't be meeting up with my friends after this is over for a pint. Um, but if I could see your faces, I would guess that about 75% of you are looking skeptical. I agree, this is a bit crazy, right? But it is also a lot cool because this is a genuine investment in developing technology that will provide much needed breakthroughs for conservation. As Colossal learn more about how to edit genomes from wild species, how to transform edited cells into living plants and animals, how to rear hybrids of extinct and living species, other species, species that are not extinct, but that are in danger of becoming extinct will certainly benefit from the advances that they make. And while Colossal might be focusing on using this technology to bring mammoths back to life, other people can use what they learn to help corals adapt to warmer oceans, to make black-footed ferrets not susceptible to plague, to repopulate forests in North America with native chestnut trees, even rid islands of invasive rats and brown tree snakes that are currently eating all of the endemic birds. Wait. What? In the parlance of my 11 year old. That sounds great, some of you are thinking. Others are entirely turned off. This is crazy, you might be thinking. Who are we to start messing with other species in this way? Shouldn't we instead just back off and let nature recover? That argument posits that we have a choice between two things, doing nothing and doing all of the things. 
And in fact, this is the dichotomy that rules conservation today. Should we, as Ed Wilson suggests, buy land and leave half of the earth alone, or should we get our hands increasingly dirty, as suggested by people like Emma Maris? And this brings me to my two goals for today. First, to show you that we don't actually have to choose between those two things. Then, after I've done that, to show you that we do have some decisions to make and that right now is the time to be having these conversations before these decisions are made for us. So with that in mind, I am going to tell you a story about hippopotamuses. The year was 1910 and the United States, well, the world, but we're focusing for this story on the United States, was embroiled in crises. The most prominent crisis in the headlines of the time was the meat crisis, a meat shortage, or at least super high prices for meat, leading to panic in the US and globally about impending terribleness, even starvation. There was even talk at the time of eating dogs. This was blamed, at least in part, on the expansion of cereal crops across what had been cattle ranges. But in fact, the quality of the cattle ranges had deteriorated because there were too many cattle. And by 1910, too few cattle were coming to market to satisfy demand and people were freaking out. But that was not the only crisis of the time. In 1886, the Japanese delegation of the World's Fair gave to New Orleans, which was that year's host city, a gift, a plant that grows in the water and produces bunches of delicate, beautiful purple flowers, the water hyacinth. People loved it. They planted it in their gardens and in city parks, and then it started to grow. Patches of green as much as doubling in size every week. By 1910, impenetrable mats of water hyacinths were choking lakes and rivers and bayous, sucking oxygen from the water and killing fish and blocking river transportation into the Gulf of Mexico. The Department of War tried clearing it out by hand, poisoning it, even drowning it, but nothing worked. The simple but charming water hyacinth had sown an environmental and economic emergency that, as you can see from this picture here, persists in many parts of the world to today. But there was a man with a plan to solve both crises at once. Louisiana Congressman Robert Cousin Bob Broussard had crafted a resolution to be introduced to the United States House of Representatives in which he proposed to commit 50,000 US dollars, that's about 7 million in today's US dollars or around 5 million pounds, to import animals into the US and place them in lands that were not currently being used so that people could take advantage of said animals. This was House Resolution 23261. But Broussard, in introducing this House Resolution, was not thinking really about any old animal in any old place, but specifically about introducing hippopotamuses from Africa into Louisiana's bayous, where it was too wet for cattle ranching. Once there, he surmised, they would eat all of the water hyacinth, transforming the offending green plant into literal tons of edible and delicious hippopotamus meat, making everybody happy. Of course, this plan was not Broussard's originally. In fact, the idea had been to import African, the, sorry, the idea to import African animals was originally from, had been that of Major Frederick Russell Burnham, who was a scout and an adventurer who was actually the inspiration for the Boy Scouts of America. Burnham had proposed some four years earlier to his friends in the political elite that the U.S. should import antelopes and giraffes and other African animals to populate newly established land reserves in the American West. He was convinced that bringing these magnificent and edible beasts into the United States would not only solve the meat crisis, but also foster support um, from the conservation movement, in particular from sport hunting enthusiasts who were absolutely key to the beginning of conservation, both in the US and elsewhere. 
Broussard and Burnham recruited two others to their team, uh, W.M. Irwin. This is not actually a picture of Irwin. I couldn't find one when I was putting this talk together, but when I looked up uh, the Bureau of Plant Industry, this was one of the images that came up. So I've called it him, it's not him, um, sorry about that. Um, W.N. Irwin, uh, he was employed by the Bureau of Plant Industry. Plant industry. Um, his job there was to improve the country's apples, but he was obsessed with the meat question. And the fourth member was Captain Fritz, Black Panther, Duquesne. He was a man of many talents and few of them legal. Uh, Duquesne, like Burnham, was an accomplished scout and a big game hunter. In fact, he'd been hired to murder Burnham during the Boer Wars in South Africa, but clearly failed as they were working together much later on this particular adventure. Um, Duquesne was also, however, a con artist who at times had been a German spy, a prisoner, a photographer, and a fake paralytic, among other jobs. Um, Broussard discovered Duquesne when Duquesne was posing in a one-man show near Washington, D.C. as Captain Fritz Duquesne, adept and legendary hunter of African game. Duquesne's performance was obviously pretty good, and I guess parts of it were probably true. Um, certainly good enough to convince Broussard to invite him to join his panel of experts. And in March of 1910, these three experts appeared in front of a packed House of Congress to present the argument in favor of House Resolution 23261. The congressmen who assembled were enthusiastic, but they had a lot of the same questions that I'm sure you all have right now. Um, I mean, how might a hippo taste? Apparently, like a cross between beef and sweet pork, according to Burnham. Are they dangerous? Irwin offered that they might be dangerous if they were turned loose, but this was quickly countered by our expert con man, Duquesne, who happily reported, with no supportive evidence whatsoever, that hippos are naturally tame and that they in fact enjoy being led around on a leash and drinking milk from a baby's bottle. As it turns out, people were ready for hippos in the Mississippi River. The New York Times published an editorial just after the pitch to Congress in which they declared that Lake Cow Bacon, which I assume means hippo meat, was the next big thing. Made from the delicious hyacinth-fed hippopotamuses of Louisiana's lily-fringed streams should soon be obtainable from Southern packing houses. This was definitely going to, survive, going to solve both of the crises at once. The stage was set for House Resolution 23261 to pass and bring about a country of full bellies and cleared up lakes and rivers. Now, you may have noticed that there are no hippos in Louisiana's bayous. And you might be wondering, did people come to their senses? Did they realize that hippos are clearly dangerous beasts that no one eats? And if you're thinking that this must be what happened, you'd be wrong. What happened was Burnham, Irwin, and Duquesne presented H.R. 23261 to Congress too late in the session for the bill to come to a vote that year. Broussard kept meaning to reintroduce it in later years, but never got around to it. Irwin died. Burnham was sent to Mexico to protect copper mines that were suddenly threatened by the beginning of the Mexican Revolution. And Duquesne descended into paranoia that other people were stealing what he had come to believe was his idea to import hippos. And the bill died a silent death. That's a terrible ending, I'm sure you're thinking, right? A real letdown. So why did I tell you this story? Because this story nicely illustrates my first point. We don't have to choose between these two things, between action and inaction because this choice has already been made for us. Generations ago, millennia ago. Think about where this story began. Why was there a meat crisis? Because we'd become dependent on cattle. This dependence took root more than 12,000 years ago when our ancestors began the process of transforming aurochs, the wild progenitor of cattle, into the tamed cattle that we know today. First, by changing our hunting practices, taking only males or non-reproductive females, leaving in the herd those that could continue to grow the population. Then by bringing the herds closer to human settlements. And then by choosing which individuals would breed and which would not. First, it was probably about disposition. Animals willing to follow the cues of a person were bred, and those that ran away, well, 
ran away. And we got better and better at it over time, choosing to breed individuals that looked a particular way or that were particularly well adapted to live in a certain habitat or climate. Today, our planet is home to more than 250 cattle breeds and more than 1 billion cattle. That's one cow or bull for about every eight people. To make room for our cattle and our pigs and chickens and corn and wheat and other domesticated plants and animals, we took down forests and took over fields, transforming landscapes in the process. And as we moved into these newly transformed habitats, we often brought other species with us, either because we liked those species or as with rats and brown tree snakes, because they hitched a ride. Sometimes these species had no natural enemies to slow their expansion, and so their populations exploded, sometimes harming or completely eliminating native species in the process. And of course, our plans to solve those crises often involved introducing other potentially invasive species, sometimes without considering the ecological impacts of doing so. But that's not all. We'd also begun to manipulate other species by trying to protect them. Burnham wanted to import African animals to the US to put them in national parks, to give people more reasons to visit the parks and therefore justify the park's existence as public spaces. Today, these protected spaces are carefully managed and the species within them are treated just as other domesticated species are, fenced in to protect them from predators, vaccinated to protect them from disease, and counted and culled to prevent their populations from becoming too large, unmanageable, escaping the boundaries of the parks. Conservation is not, and never has been, about leaving things alone. Then there was the solution to the meat question. Hippos and the bayous ended up as unnecessary as a solution because people figured out how to turn the swampy bayous into land that could support cattle. People dredged and filled in swamps, pushed the water out, reclaimed the land and the grass grew. Rather than change our behavior, people changed the land and the organisms that lived there to make it better meet our specific needs. And as our needs continued to grow, people continued to innovate. By the middle of the 20th century, industrial scale agriculture was replacing smaller farms and new technologies had been developed that allowed us to improve our cattle more quickly and more predictably. Normal breeding, choose one mom and one dad and breed them together and hope for the best, was augmented with carefully curated stud books. Cattle with good traits were brought from every corner of the world to concentrate traits that we wanted to see and get rid of traits that we didn't want to see. It didn't even matter if what we were breeding was from the same species. In North America, bison were bred with cattle in order to try to inject some of the native hardiness of bison into cattle that were destined to live in the North American plains. Some technologies like artificial insemination, this picture that I've put up here is actually of frozen sperm straws. Um, this was invented that allows sperm from a prize bull, for example, to be used to inseminate hundreds um, to even thousands of female cows. Frozen sperm like this um, can be used for decades after an animal dies. This kept frozen and kept in good condition, allowing an individual bull to be able to reproduce well beyond his normal reproductive capacity, further increasing human control over the evolution of our cattle. Today's cattle are highly refined animals that people designed to be particularly good at specific things, like this animal is at producing milk. Today, elite Holstein cows produce 25% more milk than they did 10 years ago, while requiring less food, water, and space. Today's cattle breeds are remarkable achievements of human ingenuity and design. But there are a lot of them, and there is a cost to us and to the planet. Each cow or bull can consume more than 18 kilograms, that's 40 pounds of food every day. Methane gas released as their farts and burps, mostly burps actually, are responsible, is responsible for nearly one seventh of present day global greenhouse gas emissions. And some cattle live in conditions that are decidedly unpleasant, even cruel. Which brings me to my second point. 
Today, we are once again feeling the strain of our success as meddlers with nature. There are a lot of us, a lot of our domesticates, and we are running out of space. People and animals are suffering. There is an undeniable climate emergency and extinction crisis, and we, people, have caused these crises. But once again, we have new technologies at our disposal. Our choice is whether to use them. I think we should. And let's stick with cattle for an example. If you look at this image, there is something that you might notice about some of these cattle. Any guesses? It's going to be obvious once I point it out. Um, many of these cattle, which as you see, are pretty tightly packed together, do not have horns. Some cattle grow massive horns, like these Texas longhorns, and others, like this Angus, are naturally hornless, a trait known as polled. Angus are an elite breed designed for beef, but lots of important breeds are not naturally polled. And in many countries, farmers are mandated to remove their horns when they're young. In the US, around 15 million calves are surgically dehorned each year. And dehorning is an unpleasant, expensive, and painful process that unsurprisingly raises significant concerns related to farm animal welfare. But here there is another solution, and one that takes advantage of the new family of tools to which I alluded earlier, genetic engineering. Alison Beniniman, a professor at UC Davis, has been collaborating with a biotechnology company called Recombinetics to use genetic engineering to transfer the gene that causes Angus cattle not to grow horns to Holsteins, most of which do grow horns. This could be done the regular way. Breed an Angus bull with a Holstein cow and get a calf that, because it inherited the hornless allele from its dad, would not grow horns. But this calf would be neither an elite beef cow nor an elite dairy cow because a full half of her genome would have come from each parent. The elite traits could be bred back into her lineage over many generations of backbreeding into Holsteins, but this would take decades, possibly, during which the cow were not producing the same amount or quality of milk as their horned cousins, and during which the farmer was not able to compete with others in the industry. Using the tools of genetic engineering, Allison's team transferred just this one gene, the polled allele, that evolved thousands of years ago in the ancestors of today's beef cows, beef cattle, um, into a Holstein bull. They then, into an embryo of a Holstein bull, actually, that was developing in addition a lab. This is how this worked. They then um, uh, cloned this particular bull and it grew up in a perfectly healthy bull and they collected sperm and they inseminated a Holstein cow with the sperm from the genetically engineered bull and some months later Princess was born along with several other siblings born to different cows. Princess and her siblings that had the, the genetically engineered Holstein bull's DNA did not grow horns. Unlike her cousin, Cinderella here, who was not um, one of the, the genetically engineered bull's offspring and she did grow horns. It's pretty cool, right? So how might we harness this technology to address other problems in the world? We know that there are Lots of other challenges that we're facing as we're running out of space and have too many domesticated species and dealing with the biodiversity and extinction crisis. Imagine that we could figure out how to engineer cattle not to release so much methane into the atmosphere. We don't quite know how to do that yet. We don't know what genes are associated with this. We wouldn't even know what to start to engineer. But there are other environmental problems that are caused by our domesticated species that we do understand the genetic basis for, or at least that we understand some way that we can use these technologies to try to help out. And we can do this now. Pig farming is possibly the largest agricultural industry in the world, and it is environmentally problematic. Pig growth is limited by phosphorus. So when a farmer feeds her pigs, she often adds phosphorus to its feed. 
the pig is inefficient at converting this added phosphorus into usable phosphorus, and so much of it is excreted in their wastes, where it finds its way into the local environment and leads to eutrophication of the watershed. The EnviroPig, however, solves this problem. The EnviroPig is a pig, and its DNA is mostly pig DNA, but its genome also includes a gene from a microbe and a gene from a mouse. These two extra genes together express a protein in pig saliva that breaks the phosphorus down into usable form. Enviropigs can be fed less phosphorus, which saves the farmer money, and they can use that phosphorus that they are fed more efficiently, which saves the watershed. When the EnviroPig was submitted in 2010, more than 10 years ago, for regulatory approval, nobody was sure how to proceed. The approval process stalled, and the project and the project eventually ran out of money. EnviroPigs solve a problem that plagues one of the largest agricultural industries in the world, but our discomfort with the technologies that created it is thwarting the breakthrough that it could bring. If we can find our way beyond this impasse, what else could we achieve? Can we use this technology to save corals and black-footed ferrets, to rebuild forests and save island birds? Well, allow me to introduce you to Elizabeth Ann, who was born last December. She's pretty adorable, but she is so much more than that. Elizabeth Ann is a black-footed ferret. The favorite prey of black-footed ferrets are prairie dogs. Prairie dogs are grassland herbivores that are notable for their capacity to destroy crop and farmland by digging elaborate connected burrows and have been the subject of nearly a century of pest control campaigns, which have had catastrophic impacts on both their populations and those of the black-footed ferret. In fact, the black-footed ferret was one of the original listed species in the U.S. Endangered Species Act, and by the 1970s, people believed that black-footed ferrets were extinct. In the mid-1980s, though, a single population of black-footed ferrets was discovered near the town of Matitsi, Wyoming, and an all-out effort to save the black-footed ferret was launched immediately. Um, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, along with agriculture and academic partners, um, put together this captive breeding program that eventually learned how to make lots of black-footed ferrets in these captive breeding facilities. It turns out they're really good at this. They can make lots of black-footed ferrets. But as soon as these black-footed ferrets are released back into the wild, they eat a prairie dog and many of them get sick and then they die. The problem is a disease that was introduced from Europe called plague, sylvatic plague. Prairie dogs tend to have sylvatic plague, sylvatic plague, and they pass it on to the black-footed ferret when they're eaten. There's a vaccine, so one can imagine vaccinating black-footed ferrets before releasing them into the wild, maybe going back out into the wild and recapturing them for the revaccination. This is possible, but it is impractical. It is not a practical way or a sustainable way to conserve black-footed ferrets. So the ferrets are facing two distinct challenges. Inbreeding and the loss of genetic diversity, but there was only this one population left in Matitsi, Wyoming, that started this founded, founding captive breeding population. In fact, there are only seven individuals, seven lineages that are currently contributing to all of black-footed ferrets that are alive today. And the second challenge, of course, is disease, specifically a disease to which the black-footed ferrets have no resistance. There are, however, two solutions. First, the San Diego Zoo, thanks to pioneering work of Ollie Ryder, who's pictured here on the bottom, has an impressive and growing collection of frozen tissues collected from endangered species since the early 1980s and preserved in their deep freeze, like you see down here, sufficiently cold that the cells that make up these tissues are, impressively, still alive. This tissue collection includes several black-footed ferrets that were part of populations other than this very last one, the population that was discovered after everybody thought black-footed ferrets were already extinct. 
And last December, a collaboration between the Frozen Zoo and Revive and Restore, a, a nonprofit that's really at the cutting edge of using new technologies for conservation, as well as other academic, government, and wildlife organization partners, announced the birth of Elizabeth Ann. She is a clone of a black-footed ferret that lived more than 30 years ago. And crucially, this ferret, the, the ferret from which she is cloned, was not part of that last population from near Matizzi. And so she has crucial genetic diversity that isn't present in the current population of captive or wild black-footed ferrets. When she reaches reproductive maturity and is able to enter the captive breeding facility, she will become the ape lineage contributing to the diversity of black-footed ferrets alive today. And her DNA is markedly different from any of the other seven, seven lineages. She is, in fact, a welcome introduction of genetic diversity. But still, perhaps, not sufficient to save black-footed ferrets from sylvetic plague. So that we have to turn to another possible solution. The domestic ferret, which is an evolutionary cousin of the black-footed ferret, has natural protection from sylvatic plague. It evolved in Europe alongside plague, and it can be exposed to it and not get sick. Scientists at the Smithsonian Institution, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, Revive and Restore, the Earlham Institute, and several other partners are working to discover precisely which parts of the domestic ferret genome are associated with this resistance to plague. Once this is discovered, the plan is to use genome editing technologies to move these genes from the domestic ferret into the genome of black-footed ferrets in an effort to engineer plague resistance into the last living population of black-footed ferrets. This team is soon gonna begin the process of testing possible genetic mechanisms for resistance. And, and once they identify what these mechanisms are, this will all be done in dishes and in labs, not in living animals um, until something is actually discovered. Um, they will hopefully be able to discover something that they can use to help a black-footed ferrets become resistant to plague. We're not close to this yet. It started, but it's a long way away. But it's clear that the potential of this technology as a tool for conservation is enormous. Which brings me to my final example. Yes, the potential is clearly there, but there are no genetically engineered black-footed ferrets in the wild or in a captive breeding facility today. But there is one species that scientists have succeeded in engineering in a way that makes it resistant to a disease that's currently killing them. This is the only species that's genetically engineered to date that exists and has been engineered by people explicitly for the purposes of conservation. And this is the American chestnut tree. American chestnut trees were once the foundational tree of Eastern North American forests with billions of trees, with a B, billions of trees distributed across the range depicted here in green. But in the late 19th or early 20th century, a fungus began to attack the trees. The fungus we now know was introduced accidentally into North America in a shipment of ornamental chestnut trees from Asia. Um, those trees had a natural immunity to the fungal pathogen. Once the fungus infects the trees, it excretes acid that burns holes through the inside of the trunk through which the fungus can expand to grow. Um, as it's doing it, it causes cankers that look like this, that throttle the tree so that nutrients can't go up or down. First, this canker would form and then the leaves above it would start to wilt and dry up and fall off and then the branches and then the trunk and then the whole tree would be dead. Within a few decades of its introduction, this fungus had destroyed all of the billion trees that were alive across this native range. Sometimes the roots survive, and every now and then a felled tree will shoot out a, a tiny shoot. I like to call them zombie trees, and think of them anyway as zombie trees, which they're eventually destroyed by the fungus as it gets bigger, but sometimes, rarely, they survive long enough to fruit. Um, and there are also a few stands of expat trees, uh, trees that were planted, or stands of American chestnuts that were planted by people as they expanded across um, the North American continent during the earlier centuries. Um, these trees do still fruit and produce, produce seeds and nuts and, and 
they stand up and they look glorious. Um, but even these stands of trees, the last remaining stands, are, are starting to show signs of this, this fungal blight. So it's everywhere and all of these trees are, are dying. Several years ago, Bill Powell, pictured here, and Chuck Maynard of the State University of New York initiated a genome engineering project to save the American chestnut tree from chestnut blight disease. Using living material from these surviving shoots, um, they decided they were going to create a tree that could live with the fungus. They knew that lots of plants have to deal with fungal pathogens like this and have evolved ways to do so. So they looked around for one of these naturally evolved solutions that they could engineer into the American chestnut genome. They settled on a gene that evolved in wheat, a gene that makes an enzyme called oxalic oxidase. The job of this enzyme is to neutralize oxalic acid, which is the type of acid that the fungus excretes once it gets into the American chestnut trees. Powell and his team successfully engineered this one gene that evolved in wheat into the genome of American chestnut trees, creating a genetically engineered strain of American chestnut that they call the darling tree. This darling tree is 99.9999999999% American chestnut with one tiny wheat gene that allows this tree to be able to coexist with the fungus. Their ultimate goal is to cross these strains with trees that survive as shoots and the expat trees, re-establishing the American chestnut with all of their past genetic diversity as a dominant, mostly native species in the forests of Eastern North America. The pathway to regulatory approval is long. They're regulated by three agencies in the US and several agencies in Canada, but they are on that path. And part of this included last year a public comment period during which they received tens of thousands of comments about the darling tree, the majority of which were positive. Here's an example that I like to highlight from James Sneed, a tribal council member of the Cherokee Nation, although speaking for himself and not for the Cherokee Nation, he writes, um, we as an indigenous people have relied on the chestnut tree to provide life to our people for most of our existence. When the blight was introduced to our land, our way of life was changed and not in a good way. I hope that the new tree will show that we, the human race, are trying to become healers of our land and help restore such a vital resource to a people that have relied on its gifts of life and shelter for so many years throughout time. Healers and stewards of our earth. This, I agree, is what we need to become. We are a long way from the American chestnut trees that once dominated the eastern forests of the North American continent. But with the genetically engineered darling tree, we're on our way. As we look to the future, as we imagine how we want to do conservation, it seems clear to me that some of our decisions have already been made for us. We can't leave half of the earth alone, as there's no part of the world that people have not already irrevocably touched. We can't go backward. Instead, we have to think about our future. If we want to live in a world that is both biodiverse and filled with people, where we can reduce human and animal suffering, where we can do more with the resources that we have, then we have to choose. Whether that means getting our hands dirty by pulling invasive water hyacinths out of streams and rivers in our backyards, which today happens nearly everywhere in the world every year, or adding your name to the list of those ready to receive and plant a GMO American chestnut tree, like I have, even though I'm not sure I'll be allowed to plant it in California since it wasn't a native ranch here anyway. <laughs> or simply engaging in conversations with friends and family and maybe even powerful stakeholders about the potential of genetic engineering. We need to become better stewards. We need to act clearly there are risks associated with these technologies that we will need to evaluate and learn to mitigate. 
We need to engage with stakeholders across the world about what technologies are acceptable or might become acceptable in the future. We need to recognize that different cultures have different perspectives about what we should do. And we need to embrace whatever opportunities we might have to come together and have these difficult conversations before the research into how, into how we might actually do this, like create these technological solutions actually begins. This will be hard. Our power to change species is greater than it ever has been. And we must learn to accept and to check these powers. But it will be possible. After all, we are also different today. We have a much greater understanding of how the world works than early people had. We have deep knowledge of biology and ecology. We're getting better at evaluating risks and communicating across cultures and sharing economic and intellectual burdens. And crucially, we also have tens of thousands of years of experience manipulating nature with the same motivations as today to create organisms and reshape habitats to make the world a better place for us. Yes, there is risk involved with deciding how to use this new suite of technologies that are almost at our fingertips, but there is a far greater risk in shying away from them than there is in allowing them to mature. To avoid a future with more headlines like this, we must choose to meddle better. Thank you.